all right, so I'm John Niles Wee. Thank you all for being here on this beautiful afternoon. I wouldn't have blamed you if you wanted to walk in the woods instead, so thank you for being here. Uh, I'm here for the special year in optimization, statistics, and theoretical machine learning, and when I'm not here, I'm at NYU. And I'm interested in statistics. I wanted to tell you today about a problem in high dimensional statistics, uh, which is an area that I'm interested in. And because I know that the room is people of many different backgrounds, I want to start with a toy problem that maybe gives you a sense of the type of issue that comes up in this area. So I would argue that a fundamental primitive that statisticians want to be able to handle is detecting perturbations in data. So you have some null model, your control group, whatever. These are my purple points here. And then I have some other model that I'm interested in understanding. right? And this, maybe I did something to it. I did an experiment, or it's a different type of group, or whatever. But there's some perturbation that changes the original distribution that I had to the distribution that I observe in my experiment. And the statistician's goal is just to be able to either detect this perturbation, to estimate its magnitude, to say whether it preserves off different distances or whatever. I mean, there are a number of questions. But even just saying whether this perturbation existed in the first place and estimating it is already a fundamental task. So we can write down a basic probabilistic model for this question. Maybe I have a Gaussian centered at a certain place. And I imagine that my orange points come from a Gaussian with a different mean, perturbed by a vector delta. And I see IID copies, so n samples independently from these distributions. Now, it was known already to Gauss what one can do in this situation. It was known that if I would like, I can compute an estimator, by which I mean just a measurable function of the data that I see, so that this sort of guarantee is satisfied. Right? So that the quantity that I compute is close in squared L2 norm in expectation to the true quantity that I'm trying to estimate. Right? And Gauss already knew that this was the right rate of decay, 1 over n. So that's great, right? I mean, this looks like we're getting a lot of bang for our buck. If I have a ton of samples, I get an error that's super small. But the starting question in the high dimensional regime is, to what extent can we understand the necessity of this dependence on the ambient dimension d? Right? This seems like a question. In, in low dimensions, it's fine. But this could lead to a degradation of our guarantee if the dimension of our data is super huge. And unfortunately, one can show in this toy example that the d is unavoidable. And I don't mean just that this simple estimator necessarily has an error of order d over n. I mean something stronger, namely that any estimator that you think up is bound to incur an error of at least this order on some perturbation. So I have a guarantee that this particular estimator, delta hat, will achieve always d over n in expectation, and I can't in general do any better. OK, so you say maybe this isn't a huge deal. Because of course, when I am looking at this, it still seems if I have enough data that I'll get good performance for my estimator. But the challenge in modern statistical problems is that we should think of the dimension as enormous. right? I should think of the dimension as coming from images, from videos, from point clouds, genetic data, stuff where, in fact, D and N might be scaling at the same rate. So this D over N ratio may be vacuous as an error guarantee, might not be useful to me at all. So the, the starting place was we had some procedure that seemed to work well. But in high dimensions, things broke down, and the error guarantee does not scale well. So the game for the past 30 years in this area has been to look for structure in our data that still allows us to do something non-trivial. So you know we don't imagine that any of these are just total unstructured blobs. They're real-world data that have some structure to them. Let's try to exploit it. So to give a very simple example that's like now folklore in this area, if I assume that my perturbation has a little bit of structure, namely suppose that it has only at most k non-zero entries, then I can do much, much better. There's an estimator that instead of paying d, pays k log d, logarithmic in the ambient dimension, and only pays for the size of the support. OK, so this is a toy example, as I said. But it's the sort of thing that we're thinking about in many, many more examples as well. So I want to give you one more sophisticated example now that's related to something called the Wasserstein metric. So this object, I just need to give a definition, uh, is defined this way. I have two measures, two probability measures on some metric space. Let's suppose we're on RD for the time being, mu and nu. And I decide to measure the distance between them in the following way. I ask for the pair of random variables, x and y, which marginally agree with mu and nu that minimize this expected distance. In other words, I want to couple mu and nu together as well as possible so that the average amount that I move my random variable is small. 
So this is a definition that comes from an area known generally as optimal transport. This was inaugurated by Gaspar Monge in the 18th century. Kantorovich in the 20s sort of gave the modern formulation that looks like this. And then modern folks are working on this from a number of perspectives, including probability theory, geometry, PDEs, so on. But is it important for you that you have an L1? Great. Uh, so no, it's not important. I'll, I'll just for simplicity talk about L1 right now. Pardon me? That's a harder one to work with than the L2. Yeah, that's right. So, so uh, the question is, you can put other powers here and think of, rather than just the expectation of this random variable, looking at higher moments. There are drawbacks and benefits to different ones. Mathematically speaking, the two is the most convenient. In some applications, especially in computer science, people like the one. Everything I'll say today will apply to everything, but just for simplicity, I'll state it just for the L1 case. So the Wasserstein metric is nice because it allows me to pick up maybe more interesting perturbations in my data, right? When I say that the Wasserstein distance between two probability measures is small, I mean there's a coupling between them so that I don't have to perturb any particular data point too much. And on the other hand, when I say that the Wasserstein distance is large, I mean that there's some non-trivial perturbation in my data. So rather than just saying maybe the mean has shifted, I can hope to pick up here something a little bit more sophisticated. Maybe my data has changed in some other way, and I want to evaluate whether that's so. These two things, I mean, I just made up these pictures, but the intuitive idea is that if I take all of the orange points, I only have to perturb them a little bit so that they end up where the purple points are. Right On average, I just need to move points a small amount in order to make these two things coincide. Whereas in this cartoon that I have here, there are some points that are far away, and I have to move a non-trivial amount of mass, a non-trivial distance, in order to get them to match. So if I wanted to couple these two, I would need, in this case, always to pay an expectation some larger distance, whereas the first example, I didn't need to do so. Does that make sense? When you say couple, do you mean like a bijection between? So in this particular case, when I'm just looking at points, yes, I just mean a bijection. So think about a matching, right? A matching between these two sets of points has a bigger cost here, smaller cost in the previous example. But the definition works for any sort of probability measure I like. But yeah, exactly so. Other questions on this picture? Because we should, we should make sure we understand the Wasserstein distance before I move on. Good. So all I wanted to say is that the natural statistical question is, if I have samples from two distributions, mu and nu, I want to pick up perturbations in the same way. Before I knew what I could do for means, but I should ask whether it's possible to estimate the size of the Wasserstein distance between these two distributions on the basis of samples, and how quickly I can do it, in the sense of how quickly does the error decay as n increases. So it's been known since the 60s that there is an easy answer to this, or one answer is the following, which is there's a natural estimator, which uh, statisticians call the plug-in estimator, which just means take the empirical distribution, the random measure that comprises my NIID samples from each distribution, and just put that into the definition of the Wasserstein distance. So a computer bijection, a matching on the points that I've seen. Now this quantity, Dudley showed, does converge towards the thing that I want, w between mu and nu, but only exceptionally slowly, only at the rate. D is the dimension. D is the dimension, yes, sorry. So this is all living in RD, D is the dimension. So this convergence is exceptionally slow. Um, and indeed, he also showed examples where this estimator, at least, this plug-in estimator, did converge at that rate. So at least for this particular estimator, this was not improvable. Um, Good question. Um, so, no, in general, partially because most of the notions of distance between distributions do not take into account any metric structure of the space. Uh, and so most of those cannot be directly leveraged to get this right away. Uh, so this, right, this convergence is quite slow. Um, and you might ask, of course, whether one can do better. And, and somewhat surprisingly, the answer is still not known whether it's possible to find some better, smarter estimator than the plug-in estimator that achieves a faster rate. So a group at MIT in 2011, computer scientists, were able to show a lower bound that any estimator is bound to incur something like n to the negative 1.5 over d. Say, ah, I mean, OK, depends on your perspective. This is still bad, right? Uh, this is still super bad, actually. But 
If I'm interested in a practical question of how many samples do I need in order to reach some specific level of error, then these numbers differ by a polynomial factor in the number of samples that I need, right? I need n versus n to the 3 halves or something like this for these two different ones. So there's a, a practical question here and, of course, a theoretical one as well. Recently, we were able to show something sharper, which almost closes this bound, where there's an extra log n factor here, so that there's n to the negative 1 over d, n log n to the negative 1 over d rather than n to the negative 1 over d. But a potentially interesting open question here is whether this improvement is actually achievable on the upper bound side. And you might say that this is a not particularly exciting question. I mean, no one likes to shave logs off uh, in particular bounds. The reason that this is not is that there are, over the past, say, 10 years, there have been a number of works in different areas of statistics that displayed what has been dubbed sample size enlargement phenomena, whereas where the correct rate for estimating certain quantities doesn't depend on n, but on n log n. This was a line of work that started with people from the computer science community, but there are now many distances, such as total variation, KL, chi-squared, other notions of distance between distributions for which the right scaling is n log n rather than n. We don't know whether that's true for the Wasserstein distance or not. Let me give one more perspective here. In the case of perturbations, I said that if we assume the perturbation in the mean is sparse, then I can do something better. Right? So one might ask whether there's also something better that can be done here. And we take inspiration from the famous spiked covariance model in statistics, which was proposed by Johnstone in 2001. This idea is to say one natural form of perturbation for measures in high dimension is the following. An isotropic Gaussian, that is a Gaussian with covariance matrix identity, has total spherical symmetry. Right? This is what the covariance matrix looks like. The spiked covariance model that Johnstone proposed said, let's imagine that we have a rank one perturbation to our covariance. Beta is my signal to noise ratio. Bigger beta, the bigger the spike I have. And so Johnstone and many others, uh, some people here at the Institute visiting this year, have done a lot of work on this particular model because you can get rather sharp results about what scale of perturbations you can pick up as a function of, say, beta or the rank of the perturbation that you insert. Drawing on this philosophy that this is a low dimensional perturbation of a high dimensional model, we've also been recently considering a similar model but tailored to the Wasserstein distance. Here again, I have high dimensional distributions, but I imagine that there is some hidden subspace of dimension only k where all of the interesting stuff is happening. That is to say that there are different distributions, there's some perturbation happening on a k-dimensional subspace, but everywhere else things look basically the same. Right? There's some noise directions that don't matter. I don't know where this subspace is, of course, it's hidden from me, but I can ask whether under this structural assumption I can do any better. Turns out that the answer is yes, that under this spiked transport model that I just described, you can pick up what you would hope, namely something that depends only polynomially, indeed linearly, linear scaling in n, on the ambient dimension d. And morally, what's going on here is that the first term is the rate you would have to pay if you knew this subspace in advance, and the second term is the price to pay just to find where the hidden subspace is. So, looks good. The downside is our estimator is ugly. Our estimator just soups over all possible k-dimensional subspaces, projects to those, and looks where the definition is the highest. Did yes? you give a specific estimator, or you just said that you know, abstractly? This is the estimator that we give. Yeah, exactly. So there exists an estimator, and indeed, here it is. Um, the problem, of course, is that it's entirely unclear whether this thing could be computed, right? Whether this is computationally feasible. It looks really bad. So is there a computationally efficient estimator? Or can our estimator be made computationally efficient? We know in certain cases that the answer is yes. But we conjecture what's known in the literature as a statistical to computational gap. Namely, we can show on the basis of what is called the statistical query model, which is a restricted model of computation, that any algorithm of this SQ type actually must incur this exponential dependence on dimension. So the gap is that a computationally unbounded estimator, like the one we propose, doesn't suffer exponentially for the definition. But if we limit ourselves to this model of computation, then a computationally bounded estimator does incur this dependence. So whether there's a way to computationally and statistically exploit this low dimensional structure or other simple structures in the high dimensional setting when it comes to estimating the Wasserstein distance, 
we still don't know. And if these problems sound interesting to you, you should come find me. Thanks a lot.